Hey YouTube, I hope you're on fire today. In this video, we're going to talk about the editing part of the pictures taken during the last vlog. So if you want to see what we are going to edit now, I'll let you check it out first. Today, I will give you the five steps I always go through when I edit my portraits. The number four will amaze you. Well, no, it's just logical. But in the end, I will give you a sixth one, which is the most important one for me. And that? That's true. I will use Lightroom, but it's more of a concept, so it should be applicable to any image editing software. The very first thing we need to do before we start to edit is to rethink the framing of our image. Obviously, the composition should be made during the shooting, but it's sometimes necessary to go back on it. Either because now you have the opportunity to analyze your image, something new will impose itself on you, or else to fix small mistakes. Remember during the shoot with Mano, for example, there were some framing that I found a little not so good because of the rush, I have to film at the same time, etc. So now is the perfect time to fix that. The cropping tool has a lot of interesting options, especially to visualize different composition rules. If you want to learn more about these rules, I suggest you watch this video. You can scroll through them with the O key and choose the one you're going to use more or less. But before applying them, the first thing you should think about is the aspect ratio you're going to use. Of course, the aspect ratio can depend on the destination, the media the image is intending for. For example, for Instagram, you might want to use a 4x5 aspect ratio or 9x16 if it's for a story. But what you have to understand is that adjusting the composition is also changing the meaning of your image. You don't say the same thing in a square format as in a 4x3, a 16x9 format or in a 235 as in movies. You can use Lightroom's presets or unlock the homotety to be free to create your own ratio. The last step is to straighten the perspective lines. It's more pleasing to the eye to have strict vertical lines rather than slightly tilted ones. You can choose the strongest line and straighten it with the angle tool. To go further, you should maximize the parallelism of the structural lines of the composition. The first step is to correct any distortions in the image caused by your lens. Then manually adjust using the tool in the transformation tab to distort the perspectives at your convenience. If they are not too strong, you can try asking Lightroom to globally straighten the line by itself with full. But beware of the distortion generated by all these tools especially on portraits. I'd rather have just a few strong straight lines that will give structure to the photo rather than trying to straighten everything up and have something neither very realistic nor very graceful on a face or shoulders. And you don't have to straighten up at all. You can fully tilt a shot and take advantage of the dynamics of a diagonally composed picture. One of the advantages of Lightroom is its presets. When you get to an edit that you like and you want to reuse in order to obtain a certain consistency in your images to have your own style, you can save these settings as presets. This allows you also to have different styles depending on the type of image or the type of ambience you want to get and reapply them indefinitely with just a click of a button. That's what I've been doing over the years. I created styles that I like and I try to use them to give a graphic coherence to my work. You can also share or use other people's presets, adapt them to your own photos. And as a photographer on YouTube, it's not a perfect time I'll sell you my own set of presets. <laughs> of course, I haven't had time to work on it yet, so they don't exist. But one day, I promise. No presets are magic and all photos are different, so it's just a starting point that needs to be adjusted according to the shooting conditions. And for portraits, it's mostly the skin tones that you have to worry about. The first way to play with the overall colorimetry of an image is the white balance. If you work on a raw file, you can totally readjust or redefine it completely. You can look for the most realistic white balance by letting Lightroom manage it in auto or by using the eyedropper on an area that is supposed to represent the white point in the image. But the approach of warming up or cooling down the image to create a different mood and tell a different story is totally valid too. Okay, about colors, we are touching a sensitive area. First of all, there is technical parts, which depends on the calibration of your screen and its ability to represent colors in precise ways. Then there is the destination media, which will not represent colors in the same way between a physical medium such as print or a digital medium with all the platforms that do not use the same compression algorithms and the same color spaces. Finally, there is a personal appreciation of colorimetry. In Lightroom, we don't have a vector scope like in video editing software Software, for example. To tell you, yeah, okay, now we're really getting close to what a skin tone is. It depends on your own test and your own vision. 
Another way to change colors by changing their use, only in height or low light, is the use of split toning. We will add the desired color in the shadows or highlights. Of course, there is the famous thin and orange. We cool down the dark areas and warm up the bright areas, but it's far from being a dogma. Think about exploring a little something else. Look, this, that's pretty awful, for example. Hey, if you want more videos like this and more behind the scenes photo shoots, think about subscribing. Yeah, I know, it's like that in the middle of the video, but I was told I had to do it, not remind you to subscribe only at the end of the video. It's your fault, bro, you don't just stay until the end of the video, even when sometimes I make jokes after the credits. Sorry, ring the bell. And finally, we have my favorite type, the HSL, which allows us to directly modify all the different hues, their saturations and luminances. For example, a skin too red or yellowish can be brought back to orange. A skin a little too orange can be desaturated and reboost in luminosity without touching the saturation or luminance of the other colors of the image. Finally, don't forget the power of local retouching tools. For example, using the radial filter to change the temperature only on the face. We now have our global edit on the image. We will go into a little more detail with the next two steps. The first one is obviously the skin retouching. Again, this is subject to personal taste. If you like the skin like a wax doll, go for it. It's your right to have shitty taste. Now, I mean, I'm sorry, we all have different sensibilities and... No, seriously, it's terrible. The first thing to do is to remove small blemishes with the correction tool. Simply adjust the size, its opacity, Click on what to remove and select a neutral area of the skin for replacement. My personal rule is to remove only what is temporary. A small pimple that remains on the skin for two or three days does not represent the personality of a person's face. Molds or some skin marks are part of the model, I do not remove them. Once the skin has been cleared of small temporary imperfections, we start smoothing the skin. Here too, it is the question of attenuating the effect that harsh light has on the sensors of our cameras and which brings out the the skin grain and the blemishes in a true pronounced way. The goal is not to transform a model into a plastic doll. Globally, the concept is to add blur in the micro contrast of the skin, then to recover the lost texture with sharpness. We can use either the clarity or the texture that we will reduce and increase the sharpness. Avoid doing it with gradients, it is indeed local retouching that should be done with a brush. Lightroom offers us two presets that works well, but once again, we must reduce a little, sometimes a lot, of the effect to remain subtle. Also, it is important to apply it only on the skin and avoid anything that draws special features, such as the contours of the eyes, mouth, nose, which must remain sharp. The second step, now that we have retouched the skin, is to accentuate the details that give character to a portrait, namely the eyes, the mouth, which are the areas on which our eyes linger when we look at a face. First, the eyes, the most important. I will usually enhance the exposure and saturation very slightly and paint the iris with the brush. Then I do the same thing on the lips with a new brush so I can readjust the values. On rare occasions, I also add color to slightly change their hue. Please keep it light and avoid this kind of thing. Sometimes I also whiten the teeth a little. It's absolutely not necessary here, but it's the only image of the shooting where Manoe has a mouth open, so it will be for the example. There is a brush preset for that, but extremely strong. Think of attenuating it drastically to stay realistic and avoid this kind of thing. I whitened them. What was wrong with your old human teeth? I also sometimes use the same presets to attenuate the small veins in the eyes that a too strong light could have revealed. They become a little too red. So I have to desaturate them and whitening the sclera will also bring out the eyes more intensely. And yes, the white part of the eyes is called the sclera. Yeah, you're welcome. Finally, once these small adjustments are made, I add a little bit of sharpness on the eyes, mouth and hair so that they pop a little more in the picture. We finally have the global vision of our photo. The last step for me is to re-sculpt the light of our portrait, the Dutch and Bear. This means modifying the intensity of the shadows and highlights, basically contrasting locally to reshape the shapes of the image or redefine its reading direction. Let's take the most common example. Here I'm going to close my picture so that the reading direction can be done diagonally and does not catch on the edges of the frame. The eyes are taken directly to Manoe's face. One thing I also do on almost every portrait is to use the radial filter to slightly increase the brightness of a face to its standouts from its surrounding. I generally prefer to increase the shadows rather than the exposure, but that depends on the image. 
The gradients are for a first approach. Where we're going to spend more time is to apply this concept in local retouching with the brush. For example, to accentuate the contrast difference in the hair between shadows and highlights, to reshape a face or body shapes, etc. There is no secret here, it depends on each image and the effect you want to get. Anyone can increase the contrast slider on an image. Using the dodge and burn is often what separates the amateur from the professional, because the resulting image will really be closer to the vision and what the photographer wanted to convey. And that's the five steps I go through each time I edit my portraits. And because you didn't come for anything, I gave you another step which for me, and no kidding, is the most important. In photography, but also for any project. Once finished, don't publish anything. I let at least 24 hours go by before coming back to my pictures with a fresh eye. It's extremely important to take a break from your work to have a new vision of it when you come back to it. Pictures that seem bad to you will finally regain interest and for some others it will be the complete opposite. Especially for beginners, you'll have understood that the message today is don't go too far on some parts of the editing. Taking a break will help you to say Oh, I may be a little heavy-handed with that. Okay, I hope you've learned a lot of things today. Photo editing is a subject that I'm asked for a lot, and there's a lot more to come. If you are new, do yourself a favor. Go see two or three videos of the channel, and if you like the atmosphere, then subscribe and activate the notifications. It makes my mom very proud. So proud that she found my channel and started commenting. I haven't felt this bad since she Facebooked me. Okay, don't forget to share this video. See you, mommy. Keep on creating. I promise a joke. So, okay, it's in a bar and there is two.